This is a continuation of the reading of the book by Richard Hoskins called War Cycles, Peace Cycles. As this content is related to the broader scope of understanding macro and geopolitics, I felt this to be appropriate to include as part of the Interchain FM podcast. Enjoy. Chapter 30, 1864, Topside Transition Year, War Phase Ends. In 1864, the Wholesale Commodity Price Index peaked. This marked the end of the war cycle and the beginning of the peace cycle. The war between the states staggered on a few months longer and died at Appomattox. The northern survivors talked about their part in saving the Union, the southern survivors about the sacrifices they'd made for states' rights and southern independence. Almost a million men were dead in their graves. Gold and the Gold, G-O-U-L-D, Syndrome My great-grandfather, Dr. William Hoskins, late surgeon of the 59th Virginia Infantry, accompanied by his cousin, Dr. Christopher Nunn, was on his way home from Appomattox. They rode through devastated and still smoldering Richmond early in the morning and on into King William County on their way home to King and Queen, which is just on the other side, when they heard a woman screaming. Drawing their pistols, they rode into the yard of an old plantation house where they discovered two Union stragglers abusing the female inhabitants. Shots were exchanged. The stragglers lay dead. Not having eaten for two days, they searched the knapsacks of the dead marauders for food and in the process discovered two $20 gold pieces. My grandfather took one and Dr. Nunn took the other. The story has been handed down in the family that these two coins were almost the only money there was in King and Queen County for the next 10 or 15 years. This was part of the story, which was hard to understand. Why should two $20 gold pieces be so valuable? Could it be that a $20 gold piece was worth more than $20? In an attempt to solve this puzzle, I wrote the Congressional Library and half a dozen other agencies of the U.S. government. The answers returned were always the same and said to the effect that the price of gold since 1792 was 2067 until President Roosevelt had it changed to $35 an ounce in 1934 and called in the gold. This was the government of the United States talking, and so I dropped the subject. One day I was studying a book when I ran across something which clarified matters. This is what I found. Highest and lowest prices of gold. In 1862, it was a high of 134, 1863, high of $173.50, with a low of $151.50. 1864, with a high of 287 and a low of $151.50. In 1865, it was a high of $233 and a low of $128. 1866, high of 167 and low of 125. 1867, with a high of 145 and a low of 235. In 1868, with a high of 150 and a low of 133. It seems that while our government authorities were technically correct in saying that the price of gold had remained the same for over 100 years, they were speaking of the official price of gold. The market price was another thing altogether. During the war between the states, the flood of paper money in the north and the tremendous increase in prices made people flee paper into gold. Then, too, there was real reason to believe that the spirit of southern chivalry might overthrow the brave but uninspired masses fielded by the three sisters, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. If this were to happen, union paper money might become worthless. It could be seen from the above table that the two gold coins picked up at the close of the war were far more valuable than their face value would indicate. They were more valuable when you consider that there was virtually no other money in king and queen, paper or specie. These two coins went from one person to another and were used as collateral until 1879 when the market value of paper and gold money were both $20.67. From that time, we hear no more of the coins. I still have my grandfather's pistol, a 44 star, the same make as carried by General Robert E. Lee. J. Gold, J as in J-A-Y, Gold, G-O-U-L-D. 
In the last century, there was no law against corners. A corner was created when a group of men, on purpose or by accident, trapped another group in an unfavorable position that could cost them dearly or even wipe them out. Jay Gold, a well-known speculator of his day, was the most ambitious and came nearer success than almost any speculator in gold before or since. He wanted to do something that men have dreamed of doing for hundreds of years. He wanted to corner the men who owned gold, something that had never been done before. In 1869, a normal day's gold trading activity was in the neighborhood of $50 million, with the commercial interests taking only 5 to $6 million. The other was just speculative activity with the participants buying on 90 to 95% margin, as is the case today. In this type of situation, there may be $5 million worth of actual gold, but speculators sell much more gold than that at what they consider high prices with the intention of buying back when it declines in price. Thus, with only $5 million in actual gold changing hands on a given day, $50 million may be sold and promised to be delivered. This works well as long as gold declines. If gold is sold at $287 and bought at $100, it yields a $187 profit, the same as if one had bought at $100 and sold at $287. On a 10% margin, this results in 645% profit one way and 1,070% the other. Heady stuff. But if gold rises in price after a trader has sold it short, then we have another story. A dangerous story for those on the wrong side. This is especially true if they are unable to buy the promised gold for delivery. The corner closes. This is precisely what happened. Jay Gold, his partner Jim Fisk, and their cohorts saw that the gold decline was slowing and they quietly began buying the metal. Gold stopped its descent and started rising. It did not take a lot of buying to put gold in short supply. If $2 million worth of gold were bought, this would leave only $3 million for all the others to buy. Five years after gold had reached its peak of $287, it had declined to $100 and was technically oversold. People had begun to forget about the dream of $1,000 and $2,000 an ounce, which had created such a frenzy a few years earlier. When the short sellers realized that big buyers were running up the price, they panicked and added to the upside pressure as they themselves tried to buy back gold at any price. The corner was being closed. Stories were planted in friendly newspapers telling of the great profits that had been made in gold in the past and the great profits which were currently being made. New speculators wanting to get in on the action flocked to buy. Gold surged to new highs for the move and the trapped shorts continued to bid against each other in their desperation to buy back gold for delivery. So many buyers, so little gold. The day of reckoning was rapidly drawing nearer. If delivery day arrived and the sellers of that tremendous amount of gold did not actually have the gold, then Mr. J. Gold could demand $1,000 an ounce, $2,000 an ounce, or even $10,000 an ounce, and get it. He owned almost the only gold for sale and could demand whatever he chose to demand. The law was on his side. President Grant's Move A glimmer of hope broke through for the shorts. The rumor was that President Grant was going to allow the sale of government gold to break the corner so that many prominent people could avoid bankruptcy. The price dropped to $120. Jay Gold went to see President Grant, a visit well covered by the press. He asked President Grant not to sell government gold. Grant puffed on his cigar, grunted, but did not say what he was going to do. Gold left Grant's office and let the press believe that he and Grant had a deal and that government gold was not going to be sold. In fact, Gold did not trust Grant, believing him to be a weak sort who believed the last person who talked to him was right. There were only a few men with the gold syndicate, and there were a lot of men trapped in the corner who would be paying trips to the president. Gold determined to get out of the action when the opportunity arose. The news hit the front gates that Gold and Grant had an understanding and that gold was not going to be sold by the government. The short sellers again panicked and the price of gold rose to $169 an ounce. Jay Gold sold his gold to the frantic buyers. He didn't tell his partners. The price dropped. Jim Fisk lost heavily and was ruined, as were many others in the gold syndicate. Gold started down again and kept on going down until 1879 when it finally reached $20.67 even par with paper money. 
It was a long and eventful trip from the 287 high in 1864 to the $20.67 low in 1879. In 1865, General Robert E. Lee borrowed a suit to take office as president of a small Virginia college, later to be known as Washington and Lee. His home, Arlington, had been confiscated and used as a cemetery. The wealth of the South was gone. Planters, unable to keep up the plantation houses, moved into smaller overseers' cottages. Deserted mansions crumbling into ruins dotted the countryside. Untended fields grew up in trees. As a consequence, practically every stand of old trees in Virginia today is 120 years old. Poor and beaten, the South was still debt-free and proud. An impoverished, debt-free people may regain both their wealth and power. Her elected representatives in Washington opposed every move made by the Northeast moneyed interests. 1866. With the war over, the money supply dropped by 13%. 1,648 banks closed. Economic chaos spread. 1867. In a panic to get the economy moving again, the radicals passed the Reconstruction Acts in the attempt to make debtor servants out of free people. It was nothing personal about these acts. The drastic times demanded drastic solutions. Southern whites were denied the right to vote, and blacks were given the vote to implement new economic policies. Federal troops were moved in to enforce the laws. The new black legislatures in the South were carefully instructed by northern usury bankers how to vote hundreds of millions of dollars into existence to pay for all sorts of extravagances and make the whites go into debt to pay for them. This was the first time in modern history that a Christian people had been persuaded to put their own blood brothers under the rule of strangers. Quote, And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 21. Quote, Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee who is not thy brother. Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 15. The Babylonian system makes one do strange things. Extortion, lawlessness, rape, and brutality descended on the South. A group of veterans approached General Lee with a request for him to lead an underground resistance organization. Feeling himself too old, he recommended General Nathan Bedford Forrest, the one-man Army of Tennessee. General Forrest accepted. He called the new organization the Ku Klux Klan. Almost every Christian gentleman in the South belonged to it, its symbol the Red Cross of the Templar Crusader Knights. This underground organization was the only police the South had. The weapon of the KKK was counter-terror. There was no hiding place for the tyrants. Sadistic police, venal corrupt judges, and legislators were treated like Gideon treated the strangers in the Bible. A thrust of a knife, a pistol shot in the night. African Americans and renegades refused to hold office. These offices were in time filled by Christians. It made little difference, however, to the usury bankers that their minions had been killed or driven away. They had served their purpose. The South was saddled with backbreaking debt. This exercise in black terror cost the South more money than four years of warfare had. It was not until the early 1960s that Virginia paid her last reconstruction debts. 